Yes, please, uh, you know, let me know you, but let's uh, how can we switch off this China? Okay. Well, uh, sorry for the inconvenience, but circumstances seem to conjure against my coming here <laughs> <laughs> during my talk. Anyway, uh, just a dis uh, disclaimer, or two disclaimers. Uh, first uh, of all, uh, uh, for people who I met and I meet for the first time, uh, I, I should say something about me because other people know me and either they like it or not, they you know what they can expect out of me. Anyway, uh, I, am, uh, I was teaching history on uh, of philosophy in the uh, University of Bologna, in particular medieval uh, philosophy. I was not a medievalist, but since there was the empty position, they just put me there <laughs> to fill the gap. Uh, uh, anyway, my, my interest was uh, mainly in uh, the history of logic, uh, and so philosophy, of uh, 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 history and philosophy of science. So this is the perspective of my book uh, today. So uh, 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 as the title says, I, I was uh, trying to uh, understand uh, more than I used to uh, the reasons uh, why or what was, the, uh, uh, or better said, what were the consequences of the fact that Spencer Brown, in his uh, uh, Laws of Form, uh, declares that it's an alternative to Russell's theory of times. And so, uh, and uh, he uses imaginary values. Uh, uh, to solve uh, certain problems. And so there is this uh, uh, kind of alternative between imaginary values and a uh, uh, theory of types. And what I found remarkable, coming from my medieval uh, studies, that the same uh, alternative was already there in natural philosophy in medieval times. And, uh, uh, well, that might be uh, only of historical interest, but I, I uh, am here, I should uh, wait for your uh, criticism, uh, 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 strong criticism, because I know very little about uh, quantum mechanics. But I think that in quantum mechanics as well, you can find this alternative. As so, uh, the, uh, uh, I shall uh, try to explain what was going on in the medieval natural philosophy, then I shall take into account what Spencer Brown says, uh, uh, trying to avoid uh, Russell's theory of types, then I should see something about quantum mechanics, and then I Conclusions. Well, it's uh, just a suggestion, and uh, uh, here comes the second disclaimer. I just tried to finish my slides a few minutes ago, so it's a, not a real conclusion, but it's preparatory. Uh, so, natural philosophy. Natural philosophy, uh, AMPA is Natural Philosophy Association, so natural philosophy was the, the word the expression that was introduced in the Middle Ages when uh, the university teaching moved from the teaching of the old uh, artes liberales, liberal arts, the trivium and the quadrivium ones, uh, to Aristotle's philosophy, in the faculty of arts. And so they were calling uh, the physics 
of Aristotle, which was comprehensive for all the spectrum of natural sciences, uh, natural philosophy. And in, in this country, since it's a very uh, conservative country for certain aspects, the tradition of calling physics natural philosophy, we have done to take risk as the transactions, philosophical transactions of the world society. Mm -hmm. Or a, 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 a curious thing, if you, the, uh, there was an, an officer in medieval uh, university which was called Stationarius, who, whose job was to uh, overlook the production, the copies of the manuscripts of our work. And in this country, you, you call stationary, what <laughs> in other countries is given a completely different name. So, uh, no, that, that's just um, to say. Uh, so, uh, uh, what was the ontology of this natural philosophy? Obviously, it was an Aristotelian <coughs> ontology. Uh, the basic notions were substance, uh, matter and form. Substance, uh, well, uh, any individual thing, for instance, uh, a table or a man uh, is uh, uh, conceived as a compound, a synonym of matter and form. Uh, uh, forms, and it, uh, what about the forms? Uh, the forms, here uh, there's an ambiguity in Aristotle uh, philosophy. He uses uh, forms both in an ontological and in a semantical uh, sense. Uh, and uh, for instance, he classifies forms, which was, um, uh, uh, for instance, the uh, Latin uh, translation was uh, predicaments, so kinds of predicates. So the classic, the ten categories were ten categories of, of the things themselves, ontology, but were also ten categories of what we can say about these things. It's a substance, it's a, a quality, a quantity. Uh, here I, I gave a list of substance, quantity, qualification, quality, relative, relation, where, when, being in a position, having, doing something, being affected, the active and passive uh, actions on, on, on something. And here we deal only uh, with a substance and quality. So here is a medieval author, William Hatesbury, was one of the American college uh, cultivators in the uh, uh, 14th century. And uh, he wrote uh, the regulars of Vendi, Sophismata, and there's a tract of the three predicaments, the three uh, categories. Uh, motion, where, where do, we, do we classify motion? Is it a substance? Is it a quality? Is it uh, so? But uh, the point is that uh, the, the introduction of imaginary things, imaginabilia, as they were called uh, by them. Uh, uh, well, it's secret imaginata est logica sub mortus. As we imagine uh, latitude, well, uh, latitude uh, was uh, uh, in latitudo was the measure of the increase or decrease uh, of, a, of an intensive, what we call an intensive form. There were like heat, for instance, it could be uh, more uh, go to, towards a spectrum of latitudinous, so it's degrees. So, uh, uh, if you uh, consider a motion uh, which starts from a stand, uh, still position, and it goes on to infinity, uh, in increasing in uh, uh, velocity, so you can imagine a latitude or a degree 
of the intention and remission, so decrease or decrease, uh, uh, according to which uh, mot uh, motor maliquim, uh, something which moves, uh, uh, can increase its motion or decrease uh, it, it, its motion. And uh, this latitude uh, is uh, um, related uh, to the latitude of the motion uh, uh, in the same way as uh, the, lati uh, the motus is related to uh, uh, the distance uh, magnitude of uh, quantities continua variable transibilis uh, successive, so to, which can be uh, continu uh, in a continuous way uh, uh, going from one extreme to the other. But here, what I wanted to show is the uh, relationship between something which is understood as something uh, ima imaginable and uh, the real dimension which uh, is uh, what uh, a body moves uh, from one point to the other in, in, in actual space. So th th there are uh, things which are actual and they were taking into consideration things which could be just imagined. So the terminology, well, I should have shown this uh, just to explain the passage. There are intensive forms. Uh, there is an intensifying and a lessening of the forms, of these intensive forms. Uh, the latitude is the degree uh, or measure of intensity. Motion is an intensive form. Velocity is the degree, the latitude, or the, the, the measure of motion, and they have the notion of acceleration as well. They called it velocitatio or latitudo latitudinis motus. So the measure of the variation of, uh, of the movement uh, itself. So uh, that uh, I should have shown just to explain. So, but uh, what was the semantics they were using? We have, we have been talking about ontology till now. Uh, the medieval theory of semantics, uh, not all, in the, all along all the period, but uh, at a certain point it stabilized uh, uh, and was called the terminist semantics. Terminist, which uh, is an expression coming from uh, the study of the proprietates terminorum, so the, the, the properties of the terms, of the terms of the language, uh, the Latin language they were using. And the key notion is the notion of suppositio. Suppositio is what a term stands for. And uh, there are uh, several uh, different types of uh, supposition depending on what a term stands for. For instance, personal supposition is, for instance, the, the, the word uh, man. It stands for all individual men and women, uh, uh, human beings. Uh, that's personal supposition. The simple supposition uh, instead, uh, uh, when a term uh, like homo stands for a species, the universal, so the, the uh, universal uh, property uh, of all uh, uh, men and women, of all the human beings. And material supposition, it's when a term stands for its expression. It was a way of distinguishing between mention and reference, uh, uh, the two use uh, and mention of the two terms. So it was quite an articulated uh, semantics. Uh, so being uh, 
eh, a semantics based on the notion of superposition, it was of a referential kind. So the, the, the term stands for something. And when they didn't find uh, <laughs> the real object, they were uh, 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 enlarging uh, the, the, uh, the set of values, introducing imaginable values. And this was called ampliatio, uh, uh, the extension to uh, imaginary values, the uh, imaginary media. So this was the, the basic semantics. So, a case. How can we deal with certain terms? Paronymy, what's paronymy? Uh, it's a, a, a paronym, it's a concrete noun derived from the corresponding uh, abstract, uh, abstract noun. Uh, for instance, albus, which means white, from albedo, from whiteness. So, albus is white, is a paronym of whiteness. The, uh, the concrete noun. For instance, grammaticus from grammatica. Uh, they were using, uh, as we shall see, this example because it comes from the example which gives Aristotle in the, in the categories when he uh, gives an example of the different categories. And it was using literate and literacy. So grammaticus and grammatica, it's not a grammarian and somebody who knows just grammar. It's a, 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 a kind of expression to, uh, for a literate or learned person, something like that. that but these aren't nouns. Yes. It's not a noun. Give me a con it's, a con it's an adjective, it's not a noun. Who? Albert. Albus is white and grammatical. Well, it's a nominal expression. Right? Okay, all right. And uh, in this sense, not a noun. Right? Not, Sorry, not a noun, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, a nominal expression, you have to call it like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, no, because it's a noun. Yeah, yeah, okay. Of course, but... Thank you. Uh, whereas uh, the, the abstract is a noun. Right? So, <laughs> the, the discussion was, what does, uh, for instance, uh, and here comes uh, St. Anne <coughs> into play, Hampshire of Canterbury, or we call it Hampshire of Aosta, because he was born in northern Italy in Aosta, but he was from a uh, family coming from Burgundy, so it was neither of them <laughs> in any case. So anyway, uh, St. St. Anne. Uh, wrote a, a, a treaty, a dialogue actually was uh, a dialogue with the master and Cupid in the style of a platonic dialogue. And uh, the question was whether uh, uh, grammaticus, the term grammaticus, uh, should be uh, substance so uh, a person knowing grammar or just the quality, just grammar. Uh, uh, if it means, uh, 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 according to Anson, a substance, so a person of grammar, uh, here the, the example is white and uh, whiteness. Uh, you have an, an in, uh, you generate an infinite regress. Why? Uh, because if white is something which has whiteness, then uh, you, uh, 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 it's equal to something having whiteness, something white. So if you, uh, if you substitute ergo uh, ubi digitur, when you say aliquidarum, uh, you uh, can substitute to album, aliquid album, again, and, and, so, and you go on to infinity and you generate an infinite uh, uh, regress. Then, according to Anson, uh, grammaticus means quality, only quality, and uh, it, uh, uh, 
S is it, uh, it, uh, it means grammar, grammatica, uh, uh, sufficient, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it has been uh, proved uh, uh, that, uh, uh, as uh, it has been proved, uh, uh, grammaticum means uh, uh, grammar. Grammaticus est grammatica. But he is well aware that he is doing something against the common use of language because he says, non solum stomacabundur grammatici, so the grammarians will throw up against an expression of this kind. Uh, also the illiterate, rustici, uh, ridebunt, uh, so uh, also the people on the street they would laugh if you are going to say grammaticus as grammatica. Uh, and he, go, he says, uh, there is n uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, no uh, uh, use of, of, the, of the word, you can say grammatica est grammaticus, or vice versa, grammaticus est grammatica. So, uh, uh, by saying grammaticus est grammatica, uh, he introduces a second order object language statement because uh, he, he talks about uh, predicates. Uh, grammar is, is a predicate and uh, grammaticus is made uh, equivalent in meaning to grammatica. So, uh, and uh, this second order uh, uh, object language, and, and this is uh, uh, an interesting point for me, it was in, in the object language itself, uh, it, it, it's a way a second order statement is taken as a way of saying in object language uh, uh, something which you can say uh, on the first order level with a metalinguistic statement. So this way you can introduce self-reference into your object uh, into your object language. Oh, here we go back to natural philosophy. There is a, uh, this is an Italian, um, these treatises of the calculators of the Merton College were particularly used in the in Italian university and commented upon. Uh, well, one proof of this is that if you go to the Bodleian and you look at the manuscript of the English Mertonians, most of the uh, extant, still extant manuscripts are of Italian origin. It was somebody who, in the, at the end of the 18th century, bought in Parma, in Italy, a collection of this manuscript and took them to the Bodleian. So the, the rich <laughs> collection of Mertonian texts in the Bodleian comes from it not, but it's, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, so, let's go back to natural philosophy. Uh, this guy says, non, uh, you cannot say uh, truth, uh, with truth uh, uh, that motion is uh, uh, quick or slow. In the same way that you cannot say that uh, heat is hot or uh, 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 but you have to, to say that motion is uh, speed is uh, velocity uh, or that uh, 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 or that goes slow retardation retardation yes so this is a, a, the same linguistic trick done by Ansel <coughs> applied to uh, natural philosophy, uh, applied to uh, a notion like motion, motion itself. Uh, but it's only the, the mobile, so the object which moves, that can be seen 
uh, quick or slow. But motion itself, it's velocitas, it's the velocity uh, with which uh, the, the, the object moves uh, and so on. So, uh, there were these two ways of dealing with things. Either you could introduce imaginabilia, so uh, 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 extend the set of the values uh, of, uh, of reference, or you could use this linguistic trick uh, to avoid uh, infinite regression. So, uh, the, the motus, motion and mobile, uh, the moving thing, are of a different uh, logical type. Uh, motus, motion, cannot be used in first order statement and construed as naming some entities in the lower sense. I'm quoting uh, Desmond Henry, the professor of that term. Manchester University, and he wrote a book on the logic of St. Pancy. I remember Yes, I went to that group uh, up to Manchester just to meet him, and we invited him in the audience. Really. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, the, uh, mortus, motion, cannot refer to entities in the ordinary sense because it uh, uh, belongs to a different logical type from first order uh, terms. So, let, let, let's, uh, what the significance uh, of, of, uh, of this? Uh, in his analysis of Anselm's argument, uh, Desmond Henry has shown using uh, the system he was using to formalize uh, the Latin, which was uh, the, the Latin used by medievals was a kind of artificial language because they were introducing technical terms and doing tricks like uh, answer and so on uh, just to say what they wanted to say. Uh, uh, and, uh, anyway, uh, in order to formalize uh, this kind of, uh, uh, of language, Latin, this artificial language, the point uh, Henry was uh, uh, insisting upon uh, was that uh, standard first order logic was not uh, enough expressive to formalize medieval statements that uh, we have seen are also second order statements. Uh, so, uh, and uh, he, he makes a formal analysis using Lesnevsky uh, <coughs> ontology in order to show that in a higher order version of a regress generating first order definition of learning, such as Hansen example, uh, uh, the infinite regress cannot be generated. So, if you use a second order uh, object language statement, but uh, 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 is inferentially equivalent to the first order uh, statement, uh, uh, equivalent. Uh, so, it's just a, 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 another way of avoiding regress to express generating definition of first order, uh, first order binding. However, Henry himself observe, observes, uh, one may well ask whether this result is of any logical or philosophical significance. Since in Lesniewski's ontology, in Lesniewski's ontology, he developed this calculus uh, uh, which was a kind of version of a theory of types because he wanted to prove uh, that uh, to, to, to solve the, the, the Russell's paradox using its own uh, system. But anyway, since in Lesniewski's ontology first order definition can be shown to be inferentially equivalent to second order ones, 
given a second order definition, inference of the regress from the equivalent first order definition is still possible. So you do not avoid regress uh, in an absolute way. But this regression is no more vicious than, for example, the repetition of P, which propositional calculus allows us to infer, for instance, in this formula, P and P and P and P is, uh, uh, if you have P, you can infer uh, a sequence, an infinite sequence of uh, uh, P and P and P. So, uh, the, the problem is the problem <coughs> of, uh, which rings the bell, for instance, of the oscillations in uh, Spencer Brown. The, uh, anyway, we, we, if uh, I've got time. This is a non oscillation. Yeah. No, it's not an oscillation because it's the same, the same, uh, the same truth value. But so let's go to calculus of indication. But I, I'm afraid I have to speed up because I don't well, know. It's only 10 minutes late, so it's a okay. Well, let, that, that's uh, long. Uh, anyway, uh, if I don't finish, uh, I shall be the conclusion. So you will have to come to Pampa. Okay. Uh, uh, Spencer Brown thinks that his calculus of indication is an alternative to the theory of time. He says, the most significant thing that this calculus enables us to do is the use of complex values in the algebra of logic. Uh, obviously, with uh, uh, imaginary values. In ordinary algebra, complex values are accepted as a matter of course. In Boolean algebra, we disallow them, and uh, uh, the, th the theory of types, according to, to Spencer Brown, is just a trick to disallow uh, uh, the introduction of, uh, uh, because they say, no, this is according to the theory of types, a non uh, well formed uh, expression in formula. Why did the Russell introduce the special rule? which they call theory of types expressly to do so, so to disallow complex value in Boolean algebra. Mistakenly, it says Spencer Brown, as it now turns out, but on this mistakenly, I have some poems as we shall see. So, what does he say about the imaginary values? What we do in chapter 11 is a chapter on second degree uh, equa Boolean equations. Uh, in chapter, uh, what we do in chapter 11 is extend the concept, uh, the concept of Boolean uh, to, uh, to Boolean algebra, which means that a valid argument may contain not just three classes of statement, but four. True, false, meaningless, and imaginary. I show in the text that we can construct an implicit function of itself so that it re enters its own space at either an odd or an even depth. In the former case, we find the possibility of a self denying equation of the kind that these authors, uh, Walter and Russell, uh, Russell and Walter, describe. In such a case, the roots of the equation, so set up, are imaginary. So, the self in our equation of the, the paradox of the normal set. But uh, in, uh, in the latter case, uh, if it's uh, uh, and even that, uh, uh, we can find a self confirming with, uh, uh, which has two real, uh, two real roots. But he makes a puzzling statement at a certain point in chapter 11. I am able, by this consideration, to rehabilitate the formal structure 
uh, Heidegger to discard it with the theory of types. As we now see, the structure can be identified in the more general theory of equations. So in the more general theory of equations, as he develops it, you can find a structure, which is the structure of the theory of types. So it's not completely true, according to me, that he, uh, uh, it's a mistake or that it's discarded altogether. Anyway, um, as a general result, uh, what we want to, to uh, it says that uh, without the use of uh, imaginary uh, uh, values, we cannot deal with statements, some statements, not all of them, but some statements which cannot be decided. If you use imaginary values, some statement that in the standard theory cannot be decided, you uh, become uh, decidable. So I think that was his basic point. So uh, uh, here I'm quoting extensively uh, Luke Kaufman from this uh, uh, essay called Those of Four, an exploration in mathematics and its foundation. Uh, uh, so the theme of imaginary value captures aspects of infinity and the incompleteness of formal systems. These two imaginary values fill out a world of possibility that is perpendicular to the world uh, of true and false, uh, which is uh, something, uh, uh, if I have time, I shall get back on again. And so this is just a description of what the imaginary values do. But here, uh, Lou moves to uh, uh, an, uh, an interpretation. What are these? Uh, what's the mark itself? According to Lou, it's uh, the quintessential imaginary uh, value in the mind of the one who marks in the mind that arises in the mark. And he uh, says also the most aesthetic choice for the boundary of the first distinction is that it should be the re-entering mark and, uh, and so the imaginary value itself. Uh, and again, the boundary is the letter in non uh, of the imaginary value. The boundary can be seen as the operator that transforms Mark's state to the Mark's state and vice versa. We arrive at the abstract structure of the re-entering mark that is neither marked nor marked. And this is the imaginary value. From all of this, I uh, would believe that the quintessential uh, property of the imaginary value is self-negation. But I shall come back. Don't, don't forget the first statement, which is that Spencer Brown's mark makes a distinction in the point for the person using it. And so, refers to itself. Yes. And is therefore self-referential. It is self-referential without any of the usual infinite regress because the language is so simple that it can't regress at that point. So, at that point, there can be no argument. I see. As soon as the infinite regresses start to come in, Yes. Then one starts to get nervous. <laughs> or, or various people begin. No, but but, but uh, uh, my point, uh, as uh, I shall see, is not to insist on the infinite regress as the reason why you introduce. But the, the, it was the regress that yes. led people to make up type theories in that original situation. Uh, I take your point, but uh, I, I, I wasn't meaning. Uh, that. But then there is uh, also an epistemological uh, level in uh, uh, those remarks because it refers to Buddhist logic about Buddhism. Uh, uh, there, uh, uh, in Tibetan Buddhist logic, there is ex existence, non-existence, and that which is neither, which neither exists nor does not exist. 
Here is the realm of imaginary value. So it's this in-between space that is very interesting for me. So what does this uh, mean? And uh, here, uh, uh, this is a very important uh, anyway. The fixed point is an organizing center, but it is imaginary in relation to the actual behavior of the organism. This refers to uh, uh, to first, and this. Uh, I think it's a wonderful uh, observation. <laughs> and and from first says, I am the observed link between myself and observing myself. Uh, excuse me. I, I have to give you a correction that was given to me. I've been quoting him wrong. Link, I like links and knots. That's why I guess I use the word link. But von Forster said relation, and it's probably a better word for this. Uh, well, okay, but I have uh, the relation between myself link, and myself. Uh, a, meta a metaphoric uh, yeah. equivalent. Yes, but, but that's, uh, uh, yes, yes I, I, with relation, what I, I want to say, I, am uh, I, I, I shall uh, uh, insist on this uh, relation later on. But anyway, uh, So, quantum mechanics, uh, and, I'm, I, and here I'm open to <laughs> if I'm saying rubbish or because uh, I'm not, uh, uh, I don't know things, yes? You, so this, the law of forms resolves this infinite grasp problem? The uh, law of forms res resolves this? This no, law. no, it uses it. Uh, the, 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 the 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 it so, Does the law of forms no, no, the internet, the, 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 my point before was the fact that they were introducing new semantic categories in order to avoid the regress. Uh -huh. So they were introducing second order language in order to avoid the regress. But uh, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, and second order logic uh, uh, statement it implies the theory of types. So, that, that's, uh, so where does it sit now? What is the resolution? Where do people... Well, you could keep on arguing about it. Oh, that's the thing. And, and there's one further thing that you didn't quite yes. say that Spencer Brown <laughs> yes. says, which is that we, with the re-entry, we enter into a realm of time by iterating it. And in the realm of time, the, the paradoxes do disappear. But, in the, but mathematicians are not too happy about entering into a realm of time, as I was remarking yesterday. So, is this so like you can keep on arguing forever, just to, uh, from medieval times till now through Spencer Brown and forever, I think. Yes. Well, I was just going to argue, I was just going to say, so does this mean that it's like now mathematics is now re recognizing the need we have to introduce the parameter time? Is this the, the forefront of that? Uh, I'd like to say we should talk about it afterwards because go on for a long time. Okay. So, let, let me go to that. So, I have a particular way of reading Everett, the original Everett, not the, 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 the video or what it was the, the post many word interpretation, because it's something completely different in my opinion from what Everett probably meant. Uh, it's a long quotation, excuse me, but it, it's uh, in, in a letter by Everett to David, quoted by, what's his name? Uh, I don't know. Anyway, uh, it's uh, somebody who wrote in the staff of the Encyclopedia of Philosophy, the entry on Everett's, uh, uh, what's the original uh, formulation? The relative state uh, formulation of them. Anyway, uh, a few words to clarify my conception of the nature and purpose of physical, the physical theories in general. To me, any physical theory is a logical construct. So, well, the model consisting of symbols and rules for their manipulation. Some, just some, or whose elements are associated with elements in, of the perceived world. So it's not 
a completely referential uh, semantic. Okay, but the, is he assuming that there's an actual distinction you can make, clear distinction you can make between the perceived world and the theory? <sighs> I don't know, but uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway, what, uh, uh, and we, he says, if this association uh, uh, is an isomorphism, or at least a homomorphism, we can speak of the theory as correct. So, if we find uh, a, 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 a isomorphism or homomorphism between the theory as a logical construct and uh, the observation data, then uh, the, the theory is correct. So, it, it, in my opinion, it's a local uh, uh, referential point of view, not a, a complete referential one. And then, the theory of the universal wave function, uh, 73, when a theory is highly successful and becomes firmly established, the model tends to become identified with reality, and this is the point. So, the, 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 the model, the theory, is not totally referential, that the reality is just as the theory describes it. That's my point. So, I would insist, uh, the model nature of the theory becomes obscured. People forget that it's a model, it's a logical construct, and they think that that's reality. The constructs of classical physics are just as much fictions of our own minds as those of any other theory. It must be deemed a mistake, therefore, to attribute any more reality than uh, here than elsewhere. So, I would uh, insist, uh, probably it's my uh, leaning, that, anyway, another one. Once we have gathered that any physical theory is essentially only a model for the world of experience, we must renounce all hope of finding anything like the correct theory. There is nothing which prevents any number of quite distinct models and so on and so forth. I don't agree with that either. Anyway, anyway, I'm not, uh, I'm not arguing whether uh, uh, Scarlett is right or uh, is wrong. What my argument is, there is a linguistic uh, approach which is uh, uh, opposed to. Uh, well, well, I can say that at the very least, it, it, it's going to become a matter of opinion what's the best to. Maybe we all think that such and such a theory is the best one. Anyway, uh, 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 my point is the fact that there is a linguistic option, uh, uh, but, and uh, the many words interpretation is not what Everett himself said. It's adding referential semantics yes. to, uh, uh, to Everett's uh, uh, theory, the Everett's uh, no, no, notion. No, no, just make a comment, because I, I think there's, there's a theme Lou's presentation yesterday was presenting an alternative description of complex numbers. Yes. And the idea that you have this accretion of descriptions, descriptions layered upon one another, yes. seems is very important. And this is Gregory Bateson, it's, it's this whole idea of um, yeah. a connotation, a connotation of, yes. of uh, how we understand the world. When, um, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go on. So, just, just when a theory is mistaken for the re reality, yes. the capacity to generate alternative descriptions disappears. Because not only within the, the theoretical apparatus of that particular description, but the whole institutional apparatus which supports the making of theories solidifies and makes it incredibly difficult for anybody to come and change it. and produce just produce alternative descriptions. Yes, yes, yes. And it's like a neo Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. exactly. But there are indeed those who, who feel that it's obvious, like um, the Deutsch feels that it's obvious that the many worlds theory is correct in a literal sense. That how else could you understand? how the double slit experiment works, except that all those paths are happening in various stacks of universes. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting how different people view it. Yes, but bad. 
the, 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 the guy I was uh, mentioning before, the one who wrote uh, the entry in the Stanford Encyclopedia, uh, there is no mention, no mention of splitting words of parallel universe in any of Everett's published work. So he studied uh, his uh, publishing uh, Everett's uh, uh, <laughs> letters and so on, so there is uh, not uh, no <laughs> mention. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it was the Witt who uh, developed the many world uh, theory. Uh, not Everett himself, and in the letter before he so should read Everett. Uh, yes, uh, uh, well, but uh, my point, uh, I insist, uh, is that uh, uh, there is a possible linguistic approach to uh, consider, uh, to develop a theory. That's my, uh, the point in my whole argument. As against uh, a, a, a referential approach, uh, so uh, uh, that's my, what I would say. Uh, on the contrary, the so-called uh, the brain theory or causal interpretation of quantum mechanics based this on the assumption of hidden variables explicitly opts for an ontological approach. So they, 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 they are two. Uh, and uh, what they write, uh, Bohm and Heide, it, it, they refer to the many word interpretation not to add it himself. They say uh, that, that, that uh, their theory is uh, similar to the manual interpretation because it's objective. So that there is a realist ontological approach to it in it. The two interpretations are similar in that, in a certain sense, the many words appear in both, in uh, uh, the many word theory and in their own theory. But the difference is that in Everett, in, Everett, uh, in the Everett view, which we have seen is, I would, uh, before saying that it was Everett view, I would be cautious of the things I've said before. Uh, all these words actually exist, you know? uh, uh, The notion of, a, uh, of, of many words, in my understanding, is a different description of the, of the same world. Yeah. So that, that, that's uh, how I would understand the many, all, all the many words are big uh, business in logic, uh, it's completely crazy because it's uh, uh, basic on, uh, on reference and uh, the, the standard semantics cannot work if it doesn't take, I'm not against, well, that, that is also reference, but uh, there is another component, meaning, in, uh, in, in the meaning uh, of a term or in logic, which has to be taken. Mm -hmm. uh, does ever discuss the existence of this many worlds in the sense of that sentence? Uh, uh, well, I think this is what uh, highly uh, yeah, I know. Oh, I'm wondering whether they're projecting something on Everett that he would Yes, uh, I, I think they are projecting something that uh, was in, in our own interpretation only one of this world uh, is uh, 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 fully actualized because some even variables remain hidden. So remain silent. Okay. So I shall just browse uh, the. the <laughs> It's a funny thing, I mean, when you start thinking about quantum mechanics, you, you tend to get away, if you're, if you're in an orthodox way of thinking about quantum mechanics, from this actual world definitely exists, because every time an observation is made, actualization is happening, actualization is happening, but, but to say that there's a world out there um, independent of all the observing is, is um, nonsensical from the point of view of orthodox quantum mechanics. So they're 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 opting uh, beyond that point of view when they yes, speak. No, but, but it was just a way for me to show that, yeah, that, that both yeah. alternatives yeah. are possible. Anyway, let me uh, go because I'm only uh, 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 so let's try to, to, to go to the conclusions. Uh, theory of types uh, 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 as opposed 
to imaginary values, or language as opposed to ontology. Uh, uh, the, the, what I want to argue is that the choice is not univocal, because both choices are legitimate, and the option is a pragmatic or a, an operational one, and it doesn't depend on the domain of application. We see that. Uh, for instance, new logical uh, types are applied in medieval times, both in theology, Hansel, and in natural philosophy by Angelus. What really matters is the formal structure, which is the same, or to say it in other terms, uh, uh, and equally applied to either uh, domain. So when uh, uh, Spencer Brown says I'm rehabilitating the theory of times because I can discover in my theory of second degree equation a form of structure which is exactly the, 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 the theory of times. So for me it's the form of structure which matters in both options. As long as, it, as you have this uh, uh, isomorphism then uh, things are, are, are right from my point of view. This means that what is thought in theology may be applicable in natural philosophy, just as what is thought in natural philosophy may be applicable in theology as well. It depends on whether you focus on the observer or the observing apparatus or the observable, by, but they interact with each other. In fact, laden with consequence this interaction. So the point, in my opinion, is the interaction between the observer and the observed, between the objective and the subjective. So back again to Spencer Brown. Uh, oh, this is uh, something very interesting. I, uh, he says, <coughs> my intention is that of bringing, my hope, of bringing together the investigation of the inner structure of our knowledge of the universe, as expressed in mathematical sciences. Bring together this with the investigation of uh, 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 its outer structure, the outer structure of our knowledge as expressed in the physical sciences. He wants to match the two things. Uh, and uh, he talks about the realization of an ultimate, ultimate boundary of physical knowledge in the form of the media through which we perceive. So the problem of the uh, interaction between observer and observer is very well present there. And uh, he adds, if certain facts about our common experience of perception, or what we imagine might call, we might call the inside world, can be revealed by an extended study of what we call in contrast the outside world. So, the study of the outside world can reveal something which refers to the inside world and vice versa. Then, equally, extended study of this inside world will reveal, in turn, the facts first met with the world outside. Am I out of time? You are out of time. Okay, well. In that case, I think we are running late. We'll skip questions uh, for this talk. I think you must do that. <laughs> uh, no, the, the, the point I was saying that uh, the two uh, the two approaches are compatible, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the reason for the co co uh, this uh, compatibility is the interaction which is expressed in various forms of approaches. So, no, that's one thing I want to show. This is Spencer Brown, and this is an interpretation of uh, Scopus. So, this is uh, Spencer Brown's oscillation is Aristotle diachronic possibility, which is a notion of possibility which can uh, only exist in time, as you mentioned before, which is called a, a Diodorian uh, modality. It's uh, the, the, the notion of modality which is contained in a uh, very 
Soros master argument in, in, in ancient times. And this is called, so P and not P are coexistent in the same moment. And he says that in order to explain free will. In free will, I have both possibilities uh, uh, coexisting together. And then I decide, I decide, and then I actualize one or, or not the other. But, but uh, these coexistent uh, possibilities, uh, well, the place where they are is the, the realm, the abstract realm of the uh, ideas, but uh, this is another matter. Sorry. Can we re uh, reconvene at uh, if time make it five past two to start four? Four. Ah, uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>